Okay, so first off, I'm going to give you an apology. There's not a right lot of numbers in this presentation. But if you can get to grips with that, I hope you'll enjoy it. I just want to tell you about what I've been doing for the past eight years. That's one number. There'll be one later on, and that's a lot. Um, and eight years ago, we started an experiment. And the experiment was really simple. It was how to take a town like this, which is a town in the north of England, 15,000 people, where I live. It's called Todmorden, usual problems. It's called a market town, but it's got a failed market. It's uh, a commuter belt. It's got a lot of issues around health and jobs and all the other stuff that you've got. How do you take it from a town that looks like that to a town that looks like this, with fruit and veg and herbs growing all over the place in very public places, sometimes with permission, sometimes without? They're called propaganda gardens, and they're there to stimulate a conversation around local food. And before I go and tell you any more of my story, which has a heck of a lot of holiday shots and not a right lot of words, what I want to explain is why we bothered to do this in the first place. Because it's not that I'm obsessed with cabbages. Not at all. It's because I'm ready for a fight for the future. Because when I kicked this off eight years ago, I was thinking about the Real Earth Summit, which today was 22, 23 years ago. And then was whatever, do the math. And basically, um, what we all heard in 1992 was, oh my God, the world's leaders have come together. They get that there's a crisis in terms of planetary you know, resource use. They get there's a crisis in terms of disparity of income and justice, social, economic, as well as environmental. And they're going to do something about it. Totally and utterly fantastic. Well, sadly, with a few very exceptional, um, um, with a few exceptions, not a right lot has actually been done. And actually, what we've got now is the reality check. We've got IPCC telling us stuff. We've got the International Energy Authority telling us stuff. We've got all manner of people. We've got the Global Apollo Program, for God's sake, telling us stuff about where we're going as a planet. And yet, where is the conversation? Where is the need for urgency? Where are the leaders in this country about doing something to build that kind of future for our children? Because our children are in trouble. You guys are in trouble. And if we don't actually get our act together and start to think about how we live our lives, how we use our resources, our personal responsibility, and not wait for a leader, and not wait for the technology, and not wait for the mission, if we don't actually get off our backsides and do something different, we are all in deep trouble. In this recent election, where did you hear the conversations around that in some of the mainstream parties? And in my part of the world, let me tell you, we're going for fracking. So none of this, let's get rid of the subsidy for gold stuff because we need to decarbonise within the next 10 years, we're actually going for a bit more. So, heck. I decided eight years ago I was either going to drink a heck of a lot more gin or I was going to see what I might be able to do myself, just me, in that town called Todmorden that might just give us all a sense of being a little piece of a jigsaw in a bigger picture. Not a universal solution to life, the universe and everything, but just maybe to show a line of direction towards something that might be of value to the generation and the generation after that, and most importantly, to the children of people we will never meet in our entire lives, but who are, will, will be the most vulnerable if we do not get our act together. So, eight years ago, I got on a train and I thought, what the heck are we going to do? Can we actually find a language, some sort of motivational force that could help us all see that we can do a little bit of this? Because it's big stuff. I absolutely get that we need some big framework changes. The system's broken. I absolutely get that we need to inspire people to use technology to help us find kinder ways to live on this planet with all species. But if we don't have the will to do something ourselves, we are knackered. So what's that language? And eight years ago, I thought it might as well be food. Because actually, we all do it. We eat it. We grow it. We buy it, we throw it away. Whatever we do, food is the unifying language that's a really easy entry point to thinking through, are we part of a solution rather than a problem? So, on a train from London, when I was listening to this guy talking about the state of the planet, I made up on a virgin serviette packet a model. I didn't consult, I didn't read a report, I didn't write a strategy document. You don't need any more of that lot. We know everything we ever need to know if we're going to build that different future. And so, given it was a virgin serviette and not with a right lot of room on it, there's only three little pieces to this model. If you put food, local food, at the heart of the way we live our lives in our community, 
if we create edible landscapes everywhere where we live, might we start to change the way we see our environment, the spaces around us, and the interaction we have with our neighbours? I don't know. It's an experiment. Let's see. If then we put local food at the heart of what we learn, what we demand for our children in our schools and beyond, what apprentices we want to see out there going into jobs, and what peer-to-peer -peer stuff we can actually share so we can live well, even when we haven't got the right lock. Would that help us reconnect with the environment? Would that help us rethink about diversity? Would that help us think about seasonality? Again, I don't know, we're a load of volunteers, the next experiment. And then the third piece of the jigsaw. You're walking through an edible landscape every day of your life. You're learning new skills, you're reconnecting to seasonality and the environment. Is it not possible that we might want to spend the pound in our pocket on something that in support of local producers, local farmers, the local food economy, thereby reversing the fortunes of local markets? Not anti-supermarket, but an alternative, more localised economic alternative. So, basically, that is the model. Do all those three things together, could we rebuild a sense of purpose in all our communities? Could we bring back a grassroots resilience that has some traction? I've chucked a lot of money in my time at a load of different programmes, and I've seen it squandered away because there's not been any traction on the ground for the ordinary person. Could this give us a little piece of an insight to a different way of thinking about the future? Well, let me show you some pictures, and let's see what's happened. First of all, you take whatever you've got around you and you turn it into something that is interesting. Here we have a dog toilet. It was a dog toilet on the side of Burnley Road, if anybody knows anything about Tobedon, and it was unloved. It's public realm, that means to say we own it, but the local authority is the one that looks after it. They didn't have any money, so they didn't do anything with it. As a result of which, it wasn't, there was no sense of pride about it. People threw, threw down fag packets and beer cans. So. Without asking anybody's permission, why on earth would you ask permission to get to improve a dog toilet? We went out there, we cleared up all the rubbish, and we planted food. Whatever we had in our back gardens, whatever seeds we got in our bottom drawer, this is not about waiting for the cheque to drop through the letterbox before you start, or the backs into your account. This is about getting on and doing it yourself with what you've got. So we worked overnight, and we turned it into something that was wonderful. And people really like it. And people started to think, oh, this is really cool. And the local authority blessed their little cotton socks, not having been asked for permission, because why, you know, people feel bad. You say, would you mind if we tied you up that space? And the local authority officer says, oh, I don't think you can. I'll have to take it to committee. So my view would be, do not bother asking them in the first place. Just get on and do something about it. <laughs> so as a result of that, 18 months into it, the local authority started mowing it and put a bench there so that people could enjoy it. Isn't it interesting how you start to see the impact one hand claps, the other hand joins it. This is another propaganda garden. All our propaganda gardeners are out there, about 17 of them in Tomberdon, for food to share. So that it starts that conversation, but also that sense of giving and taking in a community. This is Mary's front garden. It used to be a perfectly normal front garden. Had a high wall and lots of petunias or whatever in it. So Mary took down that wall, she planted edibles in there, and we put a great big whacking sign. Because people have forgotten what grows, how it grows, how you pick it, what you do with it. So we simply put something on there with a traffic light. If it's red, don't touch it. If it's on bow, you get in there. And when it's green, you can help yourself. Now, of course, because we're Brits, we don't do things like that, do we? So we walk past it every single day of our lives. Until one day, a young child climbs over that wall, goes into the garden, picks some food, takes it home to the mum on one of the estates, as it happens, which is one of our poorer areas. And by the way, this is a movement for everybody. If you eat, you're in. You don't have to have any special qualifications to be part of Incredible Edible. The child takes the food home, the mother turns it into something, and miraculously, the next morning, on the doorstep of Mary's front step, was a bowl of soup made by complete strangers with the veg and the herbs from that garden. And that was another interesting example about how simply meeting people halfway, folks can be magnificent. Then we've got the good old health centre. We build a brand new health centre we surround it by prickly, inedible plants, and then the NHS runs a multi-million pound Eat Five a Day campaign. Well, that doesn't make a right lot of sense, does it, in terms of public resources? So we went to the doctors, we asked, we, could we take some stuff up? They said we could. We turned that into a living, edible landscape with apples and pears and raspberries and strawberries and an apothecary garden at the back so that people could start to rethink the connection between good food and health, and we haven't spent a single penny of anybody's public money. 
And the interesting thing about that now is that the local doctors and the local hospitals are all coming to us as volunteers in the community to work with them to create every single edible doctor's surgery in our valley so that people can start to think of health and well-being, not illness, when they come to the doctors. This is not a movement about growing veg. This is about growing a different way of thinking about how we use resources and what we can do ourselves. Here we've got the good old job centre. Now, you've lost your job and you have to walk through that tarmac on the top right-hand corner every single week. Why would you want to do that? So we turned that into an edible landscape. Really small things, didn't cost a right lot of money, did it in the middle of winter, granted, which wasn't the best time to actually do it. But maybe just offering to the person who has to do that, who's lost the job, a possibility of retraining, a thought about what they might want to do in the time they've got at home, in their front garden or their back garden, just drip, drip, drip of an alternative way of seeing life. And because we have a sense of humour, and because there was a good strip in front of the police station, we did ask the police, because we're not barking mad, could we pick, uh, plant something at the front? And with some wood that we won from B&Q, we built that. Now, that's sweet corn. It's not, you know, native to Tobberdom. But it made us laugh, and it's taller than the police. And the really interesting thing about that is that the police from all over the country now come to see what we've done there, because it doesn't cost them any money whatsoever, but their own stats show the community relations with all the edible landscapes in the middle of Tomberton and the conversations that are happening with the police and other authorities have never been better, and that vandalism in the town is down because nobody vandalises food. They just don't do it. They'll still nap in the daffodils in the park, but they will not pick up parsnips. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> if they did, you'd just plant some more because you've not just destroyed the Taj Mahal, have you? You've just literally taken up a food crop. So that's your edible landscape. Imagine a child from eight to eight. Imagine the eight years that this has been going on. A child for eight years has walked through that. That's a different proposition to only seeing food in a plastic bag in a supermarket and not even considering whether it's been flown from a country that could do with that food itself. It's interesting. But what about the learning and how to do it? Of course, there are a lot of stuff going on in schools and we try and join the docks where we can, trying to inspire young people to do stuff, to learn new skills, to get the soil under their fingers. But we also work with schools to show them about hydroponics. We also work with them to talk about aquaponics. And we try and get the secondary schools to understand the science behind that and that we need the soil scientists of the future. And it's really important that we inspire our engineers to grow vertically. And it's so important that we understand the mathematics behind some of the stuff that's going on. It's a huge challenge at the moment in the secondary sector in this country, but we're not about to give up on it. However, what is important is what we do without being negative. And what we do is show people how to graft trees so they can create their own orchards for not a right lot of money in their towns, around their towns, at the heart of their towns, so that when Jonathan Porritt says, hey, we've got to do 40% more of our food from our urban centres by 2050, some of us are trying to invest in those urban farmers because there's not a right lot going out there besides that. Then we're also showing people about how to cook it. And obviously, we rack up on streets. We never ask permission. We just show people how to cook this stuff seasonally. And as a result of that, we've got some spin-offs. So some women and some other people are starting with new programs around social enterprise, around cooperatives, around baking bread, whatever it might be. Very, very simple stuff. There's nothing unique, no clever about this. It's just a little bit joined up around a sense of place. And it never stops. This is a forever project. For some reason in this world, we think if it can't be done in one, two or three years, we're not going to bother doing it, it's a failure. Forget it. This is a reversal of decades of thinking about how we are living and our relationships and our future and that concept of prosperity and kindness. So we're going to be doing it for as long as we draw breath. What about sticking money? If you've got an edible landscape, and if you are doing new skills and connecting with seasonality, let's have a look what might happen. We've not got any money, we've no core funding, so basically, we did a little bit of fundraising. We gave every single market stall in our market one of those blackboards so they could chalk up what was local. The interesting thing is, five years on, with more market stalls now doing local food, with more people moving into the area wanting to start their own companies, we've got more restaurants and cafes and God knows what, each and every one of them responding to the demand about local food. That has been stimulated by a community group, each and every one of them creating that grassroots economic vitality that we're going to need when we stop flying stuff all over the planet. That guy down there has started to make wonderful cheeses that are prize winning. We've got pickles and bottles and more beer than you can shake a stick at. 
And that wasn't possible eight years ago. We were a town that didn't believe in ourselves. We were next to a place called Hebden Bridge that was so funky and wonderful. Now, that is so yesterday. Tobin is where it's at. And all because a bunch of people, and I'm really clear about it, decided they were going to rethink their own future and not wait for anybody's permission. But the biggest thing we've done for the economy is create a new form of tourism, which is called vegetable tourism. And people come from all over the world to have a look at what we're doing, not because we're better than anybody else at growing cabbages, but because we are growing our self-belief. We created a green route so that people could actually walk past our propaganda gardens, but more importantly, walk through our market, spend some money, walk past our little shops, walk past our cafes, have a little drink, instead of nipping to the supermarket and back. And now that has been adopted by the doctors as a health route. We never micromanaged any of this. If you open the door of opportunity, all sorts of wonderful people come through. We're huge in Japan, Korea and China. We just haven't the foggiest idea what they're saying about us. But, they, <laughs> but it is interesting that everybody, irrespective of culture, is interesting in what we can do ourselves in these times of challenges. So we've got edible green routes along our canal, which again we never asked anybody's permission for. That's being picked up in Japan because some parts of Japan have got a heck of a lot of uh, canals themselves. Some of the stuff that we're actually doing around propaganda gardening was picked up with the re regeneration of Christchurch after the, um, after the earthquake. All manner of spin-offs. We created a site in the middle of town that was a complete dead site, which we called Polynesian Street. It's not a real sign, it's not a real street. We just made it up. We persuaded the local authority to let us do this. They said, you can as long as it doesn't cost us any money and we don't need to do it. It's a well tried and tested phrase. <laughs> and as a result of that, we now have, in the middle of town, a sense of pride around our green space. People picnic there. There are benches there. From being a dead, hardcore centre, we now have a sense of a future that's greener than the one in the past. And as a result of all that, a bunch of people in this market, in this market town are now interested in their future. If you'd talked to them about neighbourhood plans eight years ago, they wouldn't have been the least bit interested. Now they've got a view. They've got a view where the market should be going, how much space they should have around their housing, where the processing unit should be, whether there should be a building in their green pollination street, or whether it's going to remain a green space. There's a huge petition at the moment because there's a fight between the local council and our town. And it will be interesting to see which way it goes. But I'll tell you, eight years ago, nobody said a word. And so here's the thing. Is this just a nutty little town of 15,000 people with a few wonky women who decide they want to do something about it? Or is it just an idea that is of its time? Well, I think we can say it is. We've got 106 communities now all over England doing this type of stuff. We've got hundreds across the globe. And each and every one of them is looking to the next eight years now. How do we evaluate the social, economic, environmental impact? How do we know the impact of the social networks and that feeling of self-esteem and positivity? How can we start to change policy, planning policy, health policy, educational policy? How can we challenge the people who, are made, who have made the traditional frameworks of our lives start to rethink? Because the system is broken and it's about time they started to think outside their boxes and meet us halfway. We've created a network so that we can talk through these things and we're looking to create a corridor from Liverpool to Hull with a braided, incredible, edible approach to regeneration. And all these things have taught me one thing more than anything else in the world. When the sophisticates say you can't do this, it's too difficult, you need professionals. You need to say to them there is one thing that has been evidenced over these eight years by very ordinary people. The power of small actions can change your history. Thank you.